I'm not going to bother with an intro for this video, and will instead just get straight into why Disney Live Action Remake number 18, or LAR 18, which I refuse to call by the name that Disney have stolen for it, The Little Mermaid, is the worst movie of 2023 so far. If you want to know my thoughts about Disney remakes generally, I did an in-depth video about them recently, the link is in the description. For the sake of variety, I am going to start with the worst part of this movie. This will not come as a shock to anyone who has had the misfortune of seeing LAR 18, or even seen a review of it. But, just so we're all on the same page, I do have to ask you to suffer through a bit of this, for, as Kubrick reminds us, It's a huge shit sandwich and we're all gonna have to take a bite. Well, you just listen, Sebastian, I got that scuttlebutt. If anything goes, who'd ever guess, our little Ariel's, but you're welcome for the scuttlebutt. Oh, but hey, oh, get ready for the wedding, for the setting so we can't slow down the scuttlebutt. Apologies both to the viewers and to Shit Sandwiches for the comparison. What you just heard is a rap song performed by the character who I will refer to as Seagull, as voiced by Aquafina. I will be referring to the auditory aberration itself as When the Nightmares of Hell Became Sound or Nightmares for short. Nightmares is, without doubt, the most heinous, sensual violation that I have been subjected to since James Corden's solo piece in Cats. Which, previous to the release of LAR 18, was the worst sound ever captured by human technology. Or another, I'm found. But Nightmares. I would rather listen to the screams of innocence trapped in a burning building than listen to that again. When, in the near future, the UK becomes a totalitarian state and I am dragged off into the entrails of the Ministry of Truth for failing to applaud long enough at a pride parade and taken to room 101 for corrective processing, all the technicians who work there will have to do to get me to give up my children as traitors to the state is play When the Nightmares of Hell Became Sound. That, I can't even call it a song, that monstrosity sticks out in this movie like a good idea in a Disney writer's room. How, in the name of Poseidon, that song passed through every stage of production and made it into the final product, I do not know. Even for Disney, this is a shocking display of incompetence. When Nightmares was blasted out of the theatre speakers at its captive audience, I felt like my ears had been captured by the spider from Pulp Fiction, dragged into his dungeon and ruthlessly and sadistically violated. Halfway through Nightmares, I realised I was gritting my teeth and digging my fingers into the arms of my chair. That thing elicited the same reaction from me as bloody splintered nails scraping against the blackboard. In terms of just how bad LAR 18 is overall, it manages the astonishing feat of surpassing both LAR 16, the Pinocchio remake, and LAR 17, the Peter Pan remake, in awfulness. LAR 18 is every bit as boring as LAR 16, but while LAR 16 had the decency to end after one and a half hours of sheer drudgery, LAR 18 goes on for 2 hours and 15 minutes. LAR 17 is also much shorter than LAR 18, and while LAR 18 is nearly 2.5 hours of ceaseless misery, the brutal monotony broken only by the brief torture session that is nightmares, LAR 17 had some truly wonderful second-hand cringe moments. You have the boy's magic. No, this magic belongs to no boy. LAR 18 has none. Remade Flounder, who I will be referring to as Fish, and Remade Sebastian, who I will be calling Crab, are far too bland and vaguely horrifying to elicit anything more than discomfort from the viewers. Due to its excessive length and the dearth of anything to enjoy, even in an ironic sense, LAR 18 is the worst movie of 2023 so far. Though I have faith that Hollywood will produce worse before the year is out, never underestimate Hollywood's capacity for incompetence and sadism. When She-Hulk came out, I thought that it had achieved an unsurpassable TV series nadir. Then Willow was released, a show so bad and so unwatched that Disney have erased it from their streaming service. Then Velma happened, which everyone knew was the worst piece of media ever created in the history of sentient life, never to be surpassed. And then... 
I remember my grandmother saying to me, I don't care what they tell you in school, Cleopatra was black. Let the games begin. Over the past couple of years, I have heard it can't get any worse or we've reached rock bottom many times. There is no rock bottom in Hollywood. There is only the eternal descent into the bottomless abyss of ever intensifying depravity. I will say though that unlike Lar 17, well, that was fun. It isn't obvious that Lar 18 wants the audience to be as miserable as possible. There is the occasional attempt at a joke to break up the giant tidal wave of boredom, but they never land. In my own poorly attended theatre, no less than three people were asleep. One of them, a middle-aged man who seemed genuinely excited as he and his wife rushed into the theatre clutching a large bucket of popcorn. Over the course of its runtime, the movie managed to get a single, solitary, mild chuckle out of the theatre audience. This is the kind of movie that a guy would be embarrassed to bring a girl to. 40 minutes in, he carefully glances over at her glazed eyes and bored expression, wondering if by walking out now he is a admitting defeat, or if they should retreat from the theatre before it is too late, while his crime can still be forgiven. Lar 18 is bad in every department. The direction is indifferent and uninspired. The costume design is bland. See this scene of Triton's daughters, presumably the progeny of a large racially diverse harem, showing off the costumes they threw together at the last minute for the local mermaid cosplay. The CGI and set design is terrible. The underwater portions of the film look disgusting. They are grim, dank, excessive murky and dominated by ugly bland dark colors. Characters underwater just look like actors surrounded by green screen trying to look like they're underwater by bobbing around a little and making strange wavy motions with their arms. Triton is called King but I have no idea what exactly he is king of. You never see any great merman structures, he just hangs around his miserable throne room in most scenes and the only mermaids you see in the movie are the daughters of his harem or I don't know maybe this is his harem but he calls them my daughters because he's into a We also get a brief scene at the end showing many mermen. Uh, we, we like to say people kind. Pardon me, mer people kind, which is essentially a corporate advertisement for diversity in the workplace only for fish people. We're all different and our differences can generate various points of view and contribute to creativity and innovation. That's why, at DuPont, we believe in embracing diverse talent, valuing each member of our team, and providing inclusive leadership. We can utilize our differences to better achieve our goals and objectives. But other than that, you never see the people or physical kingdom the Triton rules over. What exactly is he king of other than a harem of young girls with Stockholm Syndrome and a Caribbean crab that he seems to have enslaved? Let's move on to one of the most visibly awful aspects of this movie, the acting. Before we get into the bad, I will say that Melissa McCarthy was very good as Ursula. She did a great job playing a children's pantomime villain. Unlike the rest of the cast, she used her body well in her performance. She managed to fit into the physical environment perfectly. She gave off exactly the right levels of creepiness, lechery, evil, cunning, jealousy, and ambition. And not surprisingly, since everyone else was terrible, she commanded every scene she was in. Melissa McCarthy's acting was the only thing in this movie that I enjoyed on any level. Now let's get straight to it. Halle Bailey's performance as Ariel, who I have decided to name Ariel Updated for a Modern Audience, or Offma. Simply put, she's terrible. After all the controversy, rock throwing, name calling, screams of racism, cultural appropriation, anti-Europeanism, politicization of family entertainment, Disney asserting that she's going to blow all the haters away when the movie comes out, trailers getting disliked into oblivion, and a growing and surprisingly bipartisan backlash against race swaps. After all that, Halle Bailey was just crap. Her acting varies between overacting, often the case when she is singing, and underacting, characterized by a very limited range of facial expressions. A vague frown seems to be a favorite of hers. While watching Bailey's extremely forced performance as Offma, I never felt like I was watching a character in a movie. I felt, appropriately enough, like I was watching a young, inexperienced, talentless actress trying her best to act. 
and failing at it. And she was trying, I'll give her that, but she couldn't deliver. She is a very good singer. Her singing is the only time she is actually watchable. The rest of the time, she's mostly just very boring. Ironically, Bailey's performance as Offma serves to demonstrate that race swaps are a bad idea. Erasure of white characters, lazy pandering to target minorities, and the sheer spitefulness of race swaps aside, it is an extremely exclusivist practice. Race swaps are not, as they claim to be, inclusive. They are exclusive. They declare that a certain role is now exclusively reserved for a person with a defined set of racial characteristics. Exclusivity is not a bad thing in itself. All roles are exclusive to an extent. I doubt the creators of Friends were auditioning 40-year-old women when looking for a Rachel. But when Disney claim they are being inclusive by artificially excluding the vast majority of actresses from auditioning for a role they should be able to play, they are not just exclusivist racists, which they are. They are hypocrites. And what was the result of rebranding Ariel as Offma, demanding that the role be played by a black teenage actress who is also a terrific singer? Disney massively reduced the pool of potential actresses they could draw on for the role. In the end, they couldn't even really get an actress and just tossed a singer into the role and hoped for the best. Unsurprisingly, the best was this. You broke the rules. He went to the above world. A man was drowning. I had to save him. You become a human yourself. Is that even possible? He's a human. You're a mermaid. But that doesn't make us enemies. I don't blame Halle Bailey for her poor showing as Offma. Disney shouldn't have cast her. They should not have race swapped Ariel and they should end the practice of race swapping generally. And yes, I am aware that Disney are about as likely to end this detestable practice as they are to release a movie poster with a black character on it in China. Javier Bardem was cast as Triton, but instead plays Javier Bardem looking bored while standing in a green screen room and picking up a paycheck. He could not look more bored if he tried. If a scene in this movie featured an alien spaceship nuking his daughter in the process of destroying an entire city, I doubt we would have gotten much reaction from him. Halle Bailey might have been shite as Offma, but she has no experience and at least she's trying. Melissa McCarthy was actually good, but Javier Bardem doesn't even pretend to care. His only excuse for his terrible performance is that he knows this movie is a piece of trash that will be completely forgotten a few months after release. And while I do find his world-weary non-performance mildly amusing, I have to criticize his utter indifference. If he wasn't interested in even trying, he should have passed on this movie and let the role go to an actor who actually wanted it. Jude Law's performance as Captain Hook was the only saving grace of Lars 17, and there is something inspiring about an actor giving a good performance in a terrible movie. It's like watching a great soldier fighting bravely in the midst of a disastrous defeat, the triumph of the human spirit in the face of adversity. Javier Bardem is an excellent actor and he should have done better instead of lowering himself to the standard of Disney live action remake number 18. Disney's treatment of the remade male heroes falls into two categories, vilification and pussification. Get your presumptuous ass out of my seat. Oh, my sackcloth well, occipital circuit is sticking. You're gonna have to do that thing again later. Yeah. Vilification is when a formerly heroic character is turned into a detestable villain. But for Prince Eric, Disney decided to go with pussification. The guy that played remade Prince Eric is barely worth mentioning. He is the Disney leading man of today, the cinematic equivalent of a wallflower. Bland, inoffensive, easily forgettable, and totally lacking in charisma, presence, masculinity, and personality. Male traits considered a threat by the establishment. Disney have gone out of their way to turn Prince Eric into some guy. If I were to describe some guy in one word, it would be simpish. He spends most of the movie pining pathetically after Offma. He also can't sing, but we'll get to that later. I'm not going to talk about Aquafina's performance as Siegel, because if I did, I would have to play segments of When the Nightmares of Hell Became Sound again, and I am not doing that. I'm not going back. There's no hiding from this, son. You're welcome. 
them for this battle, but we got a lot of work to do. So that leaves us with what is by far the worst performance in this dross by an underwater country fucking mile. David digs as crab. I'm a dead crab. Life under the sea is better than anything they got going on up there. The king can never hear it is. Okay, listen to me. Ah, get off me, you fool. Eh, eh, eh. You listen to me, bird. Eh, 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 eh. I'm a dead crab. Hurry up. Let's go, let's go. We gotta go before the sun go down. We're getting ready for the wedding for the setting so we can't slow down. Let's get over. He is horrendous. The entire movie, he's speaking with a massively exaggerated caricature of a Caribbean accent. Every vowel is overly elongated. Okay, listen to me. Get off me! Me. Me. There are cartoonish accents on every second word, and his cadences are contrived, dumb, and horrible sounding. If Crab were ordering a cup of coffee in this movie, David Diggs would blow the scene with his ridiculous overacting and disgusting voice performance. What can I get you? Me's gonna have a cappuccino, man, with extra cinnamon on the top. A crab needs some freshening for the work day. Halle Bailey's performance clearly demonstrates that she is a talentless actress, but David Diggs, he is something else. He is that special type of actor possessing of the extremely rare quality that is anti-talent. Jaden Smith also possesses this quality. What was I supposed to do? What did you want me to do? She gave me an order. She said no matter what, don't come out of that box. It is a rare curse which makes an actor completely unwatchable. So bad that they can't even be enjoyed in an ironic sense. Like for example, Tommy Vizo can. How much is it? It'll be $18. Keep, go. Keep the change. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye. I said earlier that Melissa McCarthy was the only thing I enjoyed in this movie. That's not quite true. In the third act, Ursula transforms into a hot young girl to ensnare some guy and thus keep Othma from breaking her spell. Very appropriately, Ursula's temptress form looks almost identical to a young Amber Heard. This could be coincidence, but if Disney did make the based decision to make Amber Heard the face of a siren who entraps an honest man with beauty and guile, then I applaud them for this good and correct choice. <laughs> The music in Lar 18 ranges from flat, lifeless, over-rehearsed rehashes of old songs done far better in the past to, well, when the nightmares of hell became sound. There are, I think, two other new songs in this movie. One of them I have forgotten completely, and the other is a solo piece by some guy. This song, which I forgot the moment it ended, will be referred to as The Lament of the Incel Virgin. Like a It entails some guy running around Race Swap Island crying out his love for the girl he briefly glimpsed after he woke up on the beach. It is clear from the vast amount of auto-tune this vocal performance is saturated in. I had almost drowned till you came around and you found me. That the actor playing some guy, some guy, cannot sing. I can't even refer to his singing voice because some guy's singing voice isn't his, it's Ed Sheeran's. Taste like yours, strawberries and something more. Oh yeah, I want it all. Stronger than the undertow, the night you rescued me. This singer doesn't even have his own voice. His vocal affectations, accent and timbre are a weak imitation of a popular contemporary singer and appropriately for this digestive biscuit of an actor, the singer that some guy has chosen to imitate for his rendition of The Lament of the Incel Virgin is a singer with a particularly bland voice. New songs that Disney creates for their live action plagiarisms are universally terrible with no exceptions. Last year, Lars 16 inflicted such miseries upon the world as this. Don't be a party pooper. Afraid of having fun. And this. When the nightmares of hell became sound, the lament of the incel virgin, and the other new song that I can't remember, stand proudly in this very modern Disney tradition of making their hollow corporate cash grabs as unlistenable as possible. The rehashes of the old songs are also poor. 
The arrangements are largely bland and sterile, with none of the creative risk and interesting harmonic colours of the original versions. The music also feels over-rehearsed, verve, groove, feel, dynamic range and just plain soul is not there. This is most evident with Under the Sea, which sounds like a performance from an extremely fatigued group of musicians going through the motions in their 53rd take of a song they're bored to death playing. Listen to the difference between the original Under the Sea and the remade version. Bear in mind I can only play a few seconds of each to avoid copyright, but I encourage you to check out both versions yourself to really hear the difference. Here's the original. Nobody beat us, fry us and eat us in fricassee. It makes you want to dance. It has feel. The accents are placed correctly and the musicians are playing to a clear, defined groove. It's a colourful and playful arrangement and a terrific vocal performance from Samuel E. Wright. Now let's listen to the remade version. Darling, it's better. Don't wear his sweater. Take it from me. Flat lifeless, no groove, the musicians sound bored, very little dynamic range, the music just plods along. You might maybe tap your thumb along to it, but that's about it. And David Diggs is a piss weak singer. He can't project his voice and he certainly can't project emotion to say nothing of his caricature of an accent that makes my ears feel like they're being scraped against a rusty cheese grater. Part of your world is turned from a lovely, reflective song with a vocal balanced beautifully to a careful, gorgeous arrangement Up where they stay all day in the sun, wandering. to an overblown solo virtuoso piece designed to highlight Halle Bailey's singing abilities. This is extremely amateur music production, taking a song which doesn't have a virtuoso vocal and deforming it out of its natural shape to try to force it to become a virtuoso piece. The musical techniques employed to achieve this are always the same. Overly elongated notes falling on vowel sounds. <laughs> Vibrato and improvised running notes around a climactic moment in the song. Parts of the song falling into free time to allow for this bastardization of the phrasing. Part of that. A vocal that is sung way too loud. The result is that the singer sounds like she's trying to overpower the song. What's the word? Burn. And of course, a big overblown finale that crushes the subtlety of the song. There's nothing wrong with having a big, hugely over-the-top virtuoso piece to highlight the talents of a singer. Mozart's Queen of the Night aria, Hell's Vengeance Boils in My Heart, is the most famous example of this in opera. But such a virtuoso piece needs to be written from scratch, ideally with a specific musician in mind, as was the case with Mozart's masterpiece. If Disney wanted a similar set piece for Halle Bailey, they should have written an original song. Instead, they brutalized an old song and imposed Bailey's virtuosity upon it. Before I move on, I just want to take a moment to appreciate the a cappella arrangement of this song done by this Korean a cappella group who made the biggest decision to accompany their video with an image of the real Ariel on the day LAR 18 was released. This is what a great cover sounds like. I won't go into detail on the rest of the rehashed music, but it is just as lifeless, dull, poorly performed, badly interpreted and badly produced as Under the Sea and Part of Your World. The update for a modern audience is of course present and correct. These updates include... Karen iPhone? Part of that Ofma driving the carriage during her and some guy's boring day trip around Race Swap Island because men cannot be allowed to be in control of anything ever and because a strong, diverse, powerful female character don't need no man to drive her around. Despite the fact that Ofma has never seen a horse and carriage before and obviously has no experience driving one. But that doesn't matter because... 
Changes to the lyrics of Kiss the Girl to ensure that consent is asked for. I don't mean to be forward, but I am sure that you have become aware of a sexual chemistry building between us over the course of the past few hours. Do I have your consent to kiss you? And, should that prove pleasurable, your agreement to engage in an escalation of sexual activity focused on oral stimulation, climaxing with an act of simulated breeding for the purposes of mutual sexual gratification. Prince Eric being a total simp, devoid of all masculine traits. Like a Javier Bardem's harem being more diverse than a San Francisco pride parade. This racially diverse Caribbean kingdom being ruled over by an English accented strong diverse Queen of Kings. Scenes of Ariel being a girly girl and daydreaming about her crush are purged. He loves me. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> and replaced with scenes of some guy being a girly girl and dreaming about his crush. Gonna give you all Ursula being given a vague backstory to make her a more sympathetic villain who was wronged by the wicked male king. Though, to be fair, this man did kidnap half a dozen teenage girls for his mermaid harem, so Ursula is almost certainly in the right in trying to destroy him and take his throne. Her garden of slaves is also absent in the remake, as that would get in the way of portraying her in a more sympathetic light. Ursula's song, Poor Unfortunate Souls, has had the line Get on land, it's much preferred for ladies not to say a word, and after all, dear, what is idle prattle? Erased because apparently men like it better when women never shut up. Like I literally like hate that like so much. And because a woman should always be heard however vacuous the bilge that emanates from her mind. Just like the fact of just like you like... Ariel looking hot in a rag dress and being taken in by her manly man is erased and replaced with Ariel having a blanket thrown round her and taken in by kind hearted diverse female characters because masculinity bad and femininity also bad. Scenes of women gossiping are erased. If Eric's looking for a girl, I know a couple of highly available ones right here. Because although Ursula reminds us of the importance of women never shutting up, it is inconceivable that they might gossip about the love interests of a young prince, which is why Prince Harry's autobiography, Spur, didn't become one of the fastest selling books of all time, with 3.2 million copies sold to date. An extremely contrived plot device is inserted so that Offma now does not remember her pact with the sea witch and is not aware that she has to get some guy to kiss her within three days. This unnecessary dramatic insert which creates gaping plot holes and massively convolutes Offma's character motivation was clumsily crowbarred into the story because a young woman actively pursuing the affections of a man is no longer tolerable for modern audiences. Ursula's absolutely wonderful reference to Ariel as The Little Tramp is erased because ill feeling between women doesn't exist in current year as the sterile, friendly relationship between remade Tinkerbell and remade Wendy reminded us in Lore 17. That relationship having been updated from the original, which was characterized by Tinkerbell's feelings of intense jealousy of Wendy, who she perceived as a rival for Peter Pan's affections. Prince Eric's heroic rescue of Ariel in the glorious kamikaze attack against the Sea Witch is stolen from him and handed over to Offma, because a man can never be allowed to save a woman, even if she saved him previously and because male bravery and heroism must be erased to make way for the achievements of much more diverse, strong, powerful female characters. Offma achieves this victory over the Sea Witch through an extremely difficult manoeuvre of a large trade vessel in the middle of a storm in spite of the fact that she doesn't even know how to pilot a ship, doesn't know what a helm is and even if she did has zero experience piloting a ship. But none of that matters because... <laughs> At the end of the movie, Offma and some guy don't get married because marriage is patriarchal. Instead, they just take off together to go find trading partners for the island. Because, as feminism reminds us, grinding out a miserable existence in pursuit of career and money for its own sake is far more important than getting married and starting a loving family. Family bad, giving your life over to the corporate monolith that devours hopeful youth, squeezes it for everything it's worth and leaves it a miserable, lonely, desiccated husk. Good.
The royal family, of course, do not object to the crown prince and now princess refusing to do the only activity expected of a young royal couple, engage in consensual acts of breeding for the purpose of producing offspring that can then be used to improve the dynasty's political legitimacy and diplomatic relationships. But that's okay, because self-realization through the pursuit of instant gratification and adventure is now much more important than family and children in the post-magical world of Disney. As we were reminded by Wendy's flash forward to a sad, solitary existence followed by a lonely death in Lar 17. And the modern update has not been restricted to Lar 18 alone. At Disneyland, the white aerials have been eradicated and replaced with new updated aerials, a racial purge so brutal that Heinrich Himmler himself would have looked on with approval. Disney live action remake number 18 is exactly what everyone with even a hint of sentient awareness expected it to be. Just another pointless, ugly, grim, awful pile of shite that should never have been made in the first place. But hey, what else are you going to spend $250 million on? The only good thing to come out of the absolute cinematic debauch that was Lar 18 is that it has been a major commercial flop and public humiliation for Disney. It bombed abroad and flopped domestically. Disney's live action Little Mermaid remake flopped. Just saying those words gives me hope for the future of humanity. So, Lar 18 has been a disaster, but who knows, perhaps Disney will turn things around and produce a masterpiece with Lar 19, their live action remake of Snow White, coming March 2024. It's the same plan that we used last time, and the 17 times before that. <laughs> it, it, exactly! And that is what is so brilliant about it! Doing precisely what we've done 18 times before is exactly the last thing they'll expect us to do this time. <laughs> Thanks for listening, subscribe, and don't forget to emasculate the like button.